previously awaited death. Police have identified a woman gunned down outside of a West Philly lounge as 23-year-old Dominique Oglesby. These boys are here trying to cheat. My hands cold, Sean. If they could just get that five minutes back before pulling the trigger. These young boys put a gun in their hand and they shoot anybody. You shoot him, somebody else might die inside. Don't tell me that my daughter is dead. There is the sound of mothers screaming that I can't describe. I still got bullets in my chest and around my heart. I got like three bullets around my heart. Every day so it's a rehab for me, you know. Seeing people get killed every day was just like crazy. At some point in time, you got to step up and you got to be that voice of reason with your child. They're not hanging out on the corner no more. They're hanging out on social media. I don't want innocent people in jail, but I also don't want guilty people never getting caught. Never getting caught. Never getting caught. Never getting caught. Every parent has a vision of their child burying them. When a child dies before the parent, the weight of death crushes that dream. The body count increases. Families are destroyed. From one generation to the next, the weight of death is a burden. Hello, I'm Charles H. Ramsey. I'm Mike Nutter. I'm Mikey Raw. I'm Bob Casey. My name is Kira Bradford Gray. This is DJ Diamond Cuts. And this is The Weight. The Weight. The Weight of Death. <laughs> My city, stepping outside your door would be extremely dangerous. I mean, let's face it, we have what's equivalent to a mass shooting in our streets every single day. Three-year-old Tanira Borum was one of four people struck last night on the 1500 block of Edding Street in the Grace Ferry section of Philadelphia. There is a $20,000 reward for any information leading to the arrest and conviction of a suspect. Police say an argument between two men on the street actually sparked this shooting. They say one of the men pulled out a gun and fired at another. The 24-year-old victim was hit in the head. We're told he is in critical condition. It doesn't matter if you're young or old. We are all facing a public health crisis in every city across America. You always hear people say, bullets ain't got a name, but they do seem to find a final destination. And we all out here hoping it's not inside of your child or mine. You question the circumstances with hopes of finding answers. But how do you explain a child being gunned down in the very same environment where you rest your neck at? Young, beautiful, loved, adored. This is the devastating story of three-year-old Tynira Rice Borum. The first time I found out I was pregnant with Tynira, I told her dad, Brian, well, I was happy. I was telling everybody. I told my mom. Everybody, everybody was happy for me. He said, Brian, about to have a little baby. I'm like, yep. Tanira brought a whole lot of joy to my life because I lost my parents at a young age. And my brother, like everybody that I was close to, passed away. When I had her, it was like 9 o'clock at night. She was like a blessing to us. I was in labor for 19 hours. I can't wait for her to come out. So I always talk to her while she was in her mom's stomach. Talk to her every day. Well, when Tanira first started walking, 
We were so proud of her and she was doing her little steps. She'd fall a little here and there, but she did good. Tanira cartoon character that she liked was Doc McStuffin. Everything I had to get was Doc McStuffin for her. She just was full of life. She wanted to do everything. She wanted to go to park, ride a bike, play games with her little cousin. Just everything that a normal little two, three-year-old would do. One of the frightening effects that gun violence has on our children is that it makes them fearless against violence. It makes the child believe that they are bulletproof if they have a gun or, like Biggie said, ready to die if they don't. My outlook on the gun violence of Philadelphia is one word. Simply put, ridiculous. Um, it's out of hand. If I'm not mistaken, uh, it's probably the worst that it's been in at least 10 years. What I think about the gun violence in, in the city, I feel like a lot of people, I don't want to say they're bored, but maybe they're, they might not be motivated to do anything else outside of just hanging out in the streets and getting into a lot of stuff. I feel like there needs to be more opportunities in the city for, um, for the youth to get into so they won't be into so much gun violence. It's not just a police problem. Uh, it's not just an education problem. It's not just a community problem. It's not just a, a poverty uh, issue. It's all of that and much more. It's really about the community uh, and how we're treating each other uh, as citizens and as human beings. But it's very tough. It reminds me of just how long this has been going on. I mean, I was in law enforcement as an active uh, police officer for 47 years. And even at the beginning of my career in Chicago, we had problems with gun violence in the inner city. The only thing that's changed is the sophistication of the weapons and the number of rounds that are they're being fired and the number of people being struck by rounds. So it, it's getting worse. It's not getting better. I think there are a series of steps we can take. But we also have to focus on the basic fundamentals of people's lives. If someone is not working, they're more likely to get involved in activity that no one wants them to get involved in. If someone is hopeless and doesn't because of a lack of, a, of, a, of an education or a lack of uh, an opportunity, they're more, much more likely to, to get in trouble. Gun violence is never going to end. What we can do is do as much as we can to prevent it from happening as much. As far as educating ourselves, parents, you know, being accountable. You know, when we say check your child's room, that's what we really mean. You know, when these kids got their guns, they're not hiding them outside. They're bringing them into the home. We have a lot of young kids that once they witness a shooting or get threatened or intimidated or somebody close to them has been shot, their paranoia, their fear and everything is on overdrive. And so what they do is they get a gun because it makes them feel protected. Most of them don't even want to use it. But if circumstances happen, I'm sure that's their go-to weapon to deal with that circumstance. But what we've been trying to do is understand the person and their opportunities to connect with some mentorship in their city. My grandmother used to say, if the blind lead the blind, we all fall in the ditch. Today, we need youth voices that speak to their own healing. I like to call it positive peer pressure. So we're gonna open up this platform, you guys will be on camera, and I want y'all, if y'all can, to share some of the stories that y'all have um, of people that you know that were victims to gun violence. I seen a lot of people get shot, but, and a lot of people died around the way that I grew up around. Uh, there's a lot of people that I know that has been killed, more than five at least, uh, recently on Easter. Uh, one of my friends, his name was Bill. He got shot. Well, I just started to like know him. Like we were riding our bikes one day, and then the next day he's gone. It's sad because I don't know. It's like you never know when things can happen and what the reasons are for. And it's like you you're not safe outside of your home. You can't really go anywhere because it's not safe. And like bullets, they don't have like a name on it. Like. People just shoot just to shoot, and they don't care about the consequences. No one has the golden idea to stop this. As much as people want to say they can march, they can rally, get people jobs, it's going to take multiple fronts and multiple people to actually address the issue of gun violence. Oh, I, I don't know.
lost a couple niggas that done die way too young. At the funeral, shedding tears, we had to cry way too young. Straight bullets taking lives, it's hard to survive where I'm from. I seen kids leaving school when they die on their way home. And even make it to the crib, thought it was safe for where we live. But it ain't safe anywhere anymore. Niggas blocking bullets with babies, with my city going crazy. Nowadays, I just can't take it, I can't take it. It's like all the pain I feel inside, I just want to give away. All the pain I've been trying to hide, they can see it in my face. I done lost a couple homies, I know the streets ain't safe. Knowing that we gotta die, we just waiting on that day. It's like I'm waiting on death, sitting on my shoulders. Like I'm waiting on death, waiting on death, and it's getting closer in these streets. Every night in this shit getting colder. I lost my father before I was two years old, you know, so at a very, very young age, and, and to gun violence um, in, in the Germantown section of, of Philadelphia, which is where, uh, you know, we, we were living at the time. And um, my mo I lost my mother to violence, not gun violence, but, you know, my mother was also murdered when I was uh, 15 or 16 years old. I think losing my parents at such a young age, it was, uh, an awakening of sorts, you know, it was, it was an eye opener. I had to, I had to, to grow up a, a little faster and I had to, to, to be more self-sufficient and, 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 and more mature as a, as, a, as a young person. I just remember not, be, I mean, I couldn't fathom what it was like to turn like, you know, 30 because no one in my neighborhood had made it to 230. And you know, the people who, who, who did make it to 20, 25, 30 years old, they were, uh, you know, Already, they, they were in the system. You wonder, whoever or who is it, yet it is the one. Black thought the mad exquisite. Kid to get evicted out the house, yo, I can't do that. Because I am the one that got the versatile, that's crazy. Wild it's wild, like, I, I feel like uh, I was blessed enough to be uh, included in, in, in certain programs as a young person that gave me little glimpses of uh, uh, the world beyond my, na my neighborhood and, and beyond uh, Philly. And um, that's that like that. That's what served as, as my motivation. Like that's what made me want to, you know, continue on the path that I was on because I knew that uh, you know there the, 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 there was more to life than than uh, what I was experiencing at the time. You know. Name Jesse Walker from South Philadelphia. I'm 28. I got in a wheelchair when I was 12 from a gunshot wound. Tell us about the moment when you got shot. Let's talk about that. You're just worn, going to war with another group. So me being me, I spent the block. So when I got to the corner of uh, Garrett, they started shooting at the car. I got hit one time in my back. I was in the hospital, woke up in the hospital, paralyzed. And the doctor came in. And he, was, he told me I was paralyzed from the uh, belly button down. I just broke down. I ain't cry, I just broke down, wanted to be alone. I thought my life was over, I thought, damn, like I can't walk, I ain't no females, can't no kids. He being in a wheelchair and in jail, it was, it was hard. But they, don't, they still treat, they still treat you the same way as if you was on your feet. In my head, I'm thinking, oh, in my head, I'm thinking, oh, no, y'all can't take me to jail. They took me to jail. They came with a, uh, a wheelchair lift cotton van. Actually, when I first got in custody, my dad was my celly. So I'm seeing me in there and, like, we in the same spot. That didn't look good at all to me because he wasn't around my whole life. And then when I first get locked up, I'm in the same jail with my father. What would you say to young guys out there that want to play with guns and be involved in this life? I think my advice to the young community, just know what you're doing, because you can either be in a box or you can be in jail for the rest of your life. So know what you're doing before you pick these guns up. Because at the end of the day, the niggas that you riding for or you sliding on people for, they not going to help you when you're in jail. They ain't going to put nothing on your books. They ain't going to write you. They ain't going to pick up your calls. It hurted me because knowing I grew up with these these folks and then just from them to stop, answer my car and writing me, and then I was like moving out for them, 
So it was hard for me, like, it was hard. It was hard. Ask a million y'all. Take us back to that summer night, August 1st, 2014. The night that I heard that Tynera Rice Borum was shot, uh, I believe I, I was home, if I remember correctly, and I, I seen on the news. It is Monday night, and the big story on Action News tonight is breaking news from Philadelphia police. Little Tynera Borum, outside having her hair braided by a neighbor, was killed. Was killed. Was and uh, I was shocked at first, because the first thing that came to my mind was innocence lost. You know, here's an innocent child um, minding her business and catches a stray bullet. Wasn't intended for her, wasn't intended for the person braiding her hair, but Tynera's life was lost that day. When a child is brought into this world, parents want to guarantee them two things, love and security. They grow up, go to school, graduate, start a career, get married, and have children. And as normal as that may seem, unfortunately, that wasn't destined for this three-year-old little girl. On August 1st, um, we just did our daily routines, what we usually do, and hung out, went to the store. Then later on in that evening, around Seven something, eight o'clock. She had went to get her hair braided from a girl that I knew. I was at my friend's house, maybe like a half an hour later, and the lady that house I was at, she was like she heard gunshots. So I said, "Well, my daughter not with me, so let me see what's going on." So I left the house. I was literally running around the corner. So when I got around there, it was like a block full of cops, the ambulance, it was people on the ground. So then when I turned around, it was somebody in Etten Street. They was like, your name Tamika? I was like, yeah. They was like, you Tidera's mother? I was like, yes. And they said, um, she's been shot. So once I got to the hospital, the doctors asked me, did I know where she got shot at? And I said, no. And they told me that she was shot in her chest. Maybe 20 minutes later, they came out and told me that she passed. When we talk about death, and you know, when I agreed to do this, and, and you called this the weight of death, I don't think people really understand just how significant it is. You not only killed that person, You've killed every generation that would have come from that person. It goes back to the notion if your father or grandfather had been killed prior to you being born or your father being born, would you even be here? Well, think about that. I mean, it's final. It's over. That's it for all eternity. It breaks me up to know that somebody could actually walk up to someone and pull a bullet through the head or aimlessly shoot around and, and innocent bystanders get hurt. I don't understand that. It's hard for me to comprehend that. But I'm the mayor. I'm supposed to be able to do all kinds of things, have all kinds of authority and power and responsibility. But that a three-year-old or an 80-year-old in any way in between can't walk the streets of our city or other cities across this country. This is a terrible feeling. When I hear about a young child getting shot and killed, shot Kill, beat, it, it hurts. It hurts because a child is innocent. For them to be exposed to stuff like that, or even the ones that just get hurt, and to, for them to think, like, I could have died, it hurts. It hurts. And it, it doesn't just, I don't feel like it just hurts me. It hurts a lot of people. It's just stupid, man. You got people dying just because you think, you know, they from that neighborhood, or, or you from that neighborhood. He ain't even beefing with you. You don't even know this man, but you know, he from this block, so you gonna kill him? How does your block? I said, I remember when they cut your mom gas off, right? How does your block? I remember when they cut your mom water off. How does your block? A lady down the street getting evicted. How does your block? All this ain't supposed to be going on on your block. A little girl got shot on your block. How does your block? This ain't your block. How does your block? Your mom getting high. You got dudes on the corner selling drugs. 
How does your block? It's not your block. It's the city block. We dying for this. And y'all killing each other because y'all live on different blocks, but y'all all end up in the same cemetery. And y'all families go to the same cemeteries to visit each other. Y'all walk past each other graves, right? You could be praying to your son, right? And next to him is the person who killed him. I think that um, conflict resolution is part of it. It seems as if uh, things escalate from a verbal argument automatically to gunfire, nothing in between. People don't de-escalate through conversation, agree to disagree, uh, or even have a fist fight that doesn't result in anything other than just some uh, two guys having a fight. It could be somebody that killed your, your, your best friend, killed your brother, your family member, and they out for revenge. I don't know what, what can you say to those people. I feel like the thing that we need to do right now is to jump ahead of it. Poverty is one of the driving forces, um, and this is not an excuse, but I think it is a reality. It's part of an explanation that uh, people living in high poverty circumstances, not having resources, uh, really not seeing a way out. Uh, of uh, what is intergenerational poverty in many parts of Philadelphia. We have the highest poverty rate of the 10 largest cities in the United States of America. Poverty has everything to do with how many people are driven into this justice system and how, what, they, what happens to them where they're in it. And I'm not saying that there's people that may not need to be incarcerated for certain periods of time based on what they've done, but we have overly used our, our incarceration weapon and it has spit out a whole bunch of people that are now trauma filled, that are now um, feel like a sense of hopelessness, worthlessness, and are left less empathetic for others. The system is set up, it's set up in a way that it draws you in and it's almost impossible to get out. I understand how easy it is to just say, all right, you know what? Like, this is the path that I'm gonna take because I have no other alternative. You know what I'm saying? I have a, an older brother who's about eight or nine years older than me. He spent most of his life behind bars. And you know, once you got that F, like once you're a felon, um, it's hard to find any other you know, alternative uh, to feed your family and to put clothes on your back, you know, besides going back to the streets. What you have are people in poverty that are actually trapped in neighborhoods that do experience a disproportionate amount of violence and they can't go anywhere because they can't afford to go anywhere. So they're actually victims, in my opinion. It's one of the things that we want to make sure that people know that even though people go to jail, at some point they're coming out. And if we don't answer those questions about what are the gaps, what drove the behavior, why do they feel like this was their only option to deal with whatever challenges that they were dealing with? Mental health, um, is a, is a reality in our society. We haven't treated it or equated it to physical health for many, many years. We finally got a bill passed within the last decade to, to have parity that, that insurance companies have to uh, reimburse or, or provide uh, opportunities for treatment for mental health, just like for, for a physical health problem. I have for a long time worked with, we've been working with UPenn, and I've asked them, do we have a post-traumatic stress disorder uh, funding stream for kids who have been exposed to trauma over their life or their or, or their childhood and the answer was no and I asked well why not he said well kids are more resilient and so therefore their post-traumatic stress syndrome doesn't show up the way a war vet would or an adult would and I said I don't think that's accurate because these kids right now are showing those signs of post-traumatic stress disorder and now we're trying to deal with them when it's too late The initial phone call that I received regarding Tynera actually came from her mom's friend. And she was more of uh, playing a role of a support because quite naturally, Tynera's mom, she was numb to everything. She just, she, she couldn't talk. I just remember crying saying, I just can't believe that I have to do this. The first thing that came to my mind was, geez, I have to go get this three-year-old. I got to sit down and talk to a mom who just lost her three-year-old. She only had three years with her daughter, you know? And all I'm thinking is, I've got to do something to uh, kind of create some significance to this service. 
what goes through your mind when you open up that bag and you see those little bottles? Anger. I was mad. Um, it almost, if I'm not mistaken, was a clear shot to her chest. I mean, for it to have been a stray bullet, it almost seemed like it was intentional. We know it wasn't, but it was almost dead center to her chest. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, she didn't have a chance. She didn't have a chance at survival. That morning that we have to prepare ourselves to go from Ellen Hunting Park with this three-year-old in a hearse. The whole way down, all I'm thinking about is, will the people be able to handle what they're about to see? As the doors open, her mother just starts breaking down crying. She's singing, take me to the king, while the song is playing. She cries, walking all the way to the front of the chapel where her daughter is presented. I went and viewed her. I gave her a kiss. I talked to her for a little while. And I just started to not feel well, so I had to go sit down. And it was just, it was a lot. It was a lot going on, and I was just all over the place and not in the right state of mind or anything to be dealing with that type of situation at that time. It's the final viewing. The family's coming up. The organ plays a more somber song. This is the last time before we close this casket that she'll get to lay eyes on her uh, on earth. It's the last time that she'll get to rub her little hand. It's the last time that she'll get to rub her hand across her cheek. It's the last time she'll get to touch her hair. And I just remember her taking that time to do all that, touch all over her. She rubbed her legs, she fixed her dress, she made sure that the skirt was laying right. She said something to her, she laughed a little bit, she cried again, she rejoiced. And it was just so many people standing around as we were closing the casket. It was a powerful scene to see. The funeral is just one part, you know, but what happens after that body gets lowered into the ground? This is it. And once they put her down in the dirt, that's when I kind of like lost it. I, I didn't really know what to think. I was just hurt. It was a sad situation. And I just missed my baby. And I wish that no other parent would have to go through that. But it's a lot of children that's losing their life due to gun violence. But it's just hard. It's hard. I think murderers should consider, is the person you're killing worth losing your own life? Because usually what happens is one dies and one goes to jail for a life sentence. A life sentence is nothing but a death sentence in slow motion. Parents are the first teachers. Uh, parents and our education systems, I think, ultimately play the main role in helping young people to understand that you have to figure out a different way to resolve uh, your issues, your challenges, your, your problems. Part of the problem has to do with young people 
who are not doing what they ought to be doing in school, poorly educated, can't find a job at a later point in time. I mean, all those things I think we could do a lot better in terms of government stepping up. But government can't raise other people's children entirely. Parents have to play a role here. You got some children who got a mother and a father in the house and the children still out here reckless. So just because your father's in the house, it don't mean that you ain't gonna be out here in the streets doing nothing crazy. The father, if he's gonna be in the home, has to be a father. You just can't be a father in the home. You have to be a father. Number one, you need to know what your child is doing. I mean, I came up at a time when, you know, if you closed your bedroom door, it wouldn't be long before your mother or somebody would open the door to see what you were doing. And now people feel like they're invading a young person's privacy. Well, guess what? They living in your house, they don't have a whole lot of privacy. It's about the upbringing. It's about how your parents raised you, the, the values they instilled in you. Um, you know, growing up knowing what's right and what's wrong. Then there are some parents who have no control over what's happening with their kids when they go out, when they go to school, or they hang out with certain certain types of friends, and they did all that they could. You got so many people saying, why y'all protesting? Why y'all marching? They ain't gonna lock him up. They ain't gonna do nothing. Then when something finally happened, it's like, and that's the same feeling that these families got, because most of the time they like, I'm not gonna find out who killed my son. I'm not gonna find out who killed my daughter. But you do have some detectives out here who's really, who, who are really working these cases and, and wanna get them solved. Again, it, it's, it's not as easy as just saying people just need to speak up. Well, there's a reason why they don't. And there's a variety of reasons, but some of it falls right back on police because if we're not trusted by the community, then we can't expect people to come forward to the and in terms of the numbers that we need to have come forward so that we can then deal with the people who are out here causing crime. Well, I think the reason that the black community doesn't step up as much when a black person kills a black person is because of the no snitching thing and because it's a fear. It's a fear. Most people are fear, are fear are, 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 have the fear of being retaliated, you know, against, you know, because some people, they know who the shooters are. So they say, you know, if I speak up, they know where I live at. You know, they know where my kids go to school. They know where I work at. Solving the issues of violence is not just the Philadelphia Police Department or any police department in the United States. It's really, what are you doing with your young people? I mean, you got to be more than just a, a blue and white car driving down the street at 30 miles an hour with your windows rolled up. I mean, people need to know you as a human being. And that's why, you know, getting out on foot, interacting with people, having positive interactions, not just stopping somebody to give them a ticket or, or going to somebody's house because they call 911 and they've got a problem or whatever. We need to meet people in different situations. One of the things we do most is we do what's called mitigation. And that's where we explore the history of the person and really try to understand why the person did what they did. And that is the worst part of it because what we always find is that this person has been failed time and time again by almost every system governmental systems that are designed to help improve quality of life. And so it leaves me with the feeling of why do we wait until the back end, until something furious happens, um, to start exploring what this person needs or the opportunities that we missed. And that, for me, shows me that we're dealing with situations where we are so much more equipped to deal with things once they become violent and once there are victims involved versus spending the money properly, doing our due diligence in the front end and making sure young kids in inner city neighborhoods are given the proper entitlements from the government that they deserve. And I walk away feeling like, is this a design or is this an unfortunate situation? And I can't tell which one is which. Because I feel like if we've done this time and time again, and we do this thing called mitigation, each time we have a sentencing, and we learn the exact same things, educational systems were failing, um, uh, healthcare opportunities were absent, home structure non-existent. When are we gonna start to learn what we need to do on the front end to, to try to alleviate some of this? If you haven't lost a family member yourself, then you can never say, I know how you feel, because you don't know how I mean, and all you can do is pray that it never does happen. You don't want to know how they really feel because you don't want it to happen to you. I'm not sure that, that I, any of my words could comfort a parent who's, who suffered that kind of a loss. I can't even imagine that loss. I've never experienced it, so I don't think any words uh, will be of comfort. I want them to know, though, that I feel a deep and abiding obligation uh, to try to reduce the likelihood that, that other families will suffer from what they have. 
And what's, I think, most encouraging or most inspiring is how families who have suffered so grievous a loss uh, when they lose a child to gun violence are willing to come forward and help on the problem, uh, help solve the problem, or at least reduce that likelihood that another family will suffer from that terrible dark night of loss that they've endured. Tanira Borum uh, was three years old, uh, sitting on her steps, two guys uh, about a half a block away, uh, shooting at each other, doing whatever they were doing. A bullet hit her right in her chest, killed her. That has stuck with me for the rest of my life and will be with me. I have a picture of Tanira in my wallet, and I talk about her and I show it to folks as a reminder of what my job and responsibility was as mayor, that I never wanted to forget the real impact of going to see her mom unannounced, just literally rolled up on the house one day and sat with her and apologized to her that we had not protected her daughter from some craziness out in the street. She gave me that photo. I put it in my wallet that day. It's been there ever since. Philadelphia police arrest a suspect in the shooting in Grace Ferry where a three-year-old child was killed and three others were injured. Police caught an alleged accomplice, but now lawmen say they have the man who pulled the trigger. It's innocent babies getting hit. My baby, three years old, just beginning life. I felt some relief after I found out they, they, they caught him because he, 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 he shouldn't be out here because he might do the same thing to somebody else. The trial started. Going here, it was it was hard to deal with because I'm actually sitting here with the people that actually harmed my child. They were so young; it was like two looked like two little kids. It was a lot going on in here. I was just upset, crying. They had my daughter pictures up. When they read the verdict in court, it was 20 to 40 years for the accomplice. And the shooter got 40 to 80 years. After that, I mean, I felt a relief. And I felt like I got justice for my daughter. Right now, where I'm at in life, like, I would want to forgive them. Because I can't hold on to that. We're just having hate and feeling like I, don't, I, I would just want to forgive them. Forgive them. Forgive them. Forgive them. If I could talk to the shooter, I would just want to tell him, like, he took our pride and joy away. And it was senseless. And I just want to know why. Like, what made him do that? Six years later, I'll be having a son. I'm excited about the whole situation. I just can't wait to meet him now and see what he's like and just be a mom to him now. If Tanira was here today, and what I would want to say to her that I wish things could have been different, and I love her. Next on the weight of death. Police are on the hunt for a man who shot and killed a 16-year-old in South Philadelphia. It happened last night at 21st and Dickinson Streets. The teenager was shot twice. His mother rushed him to the hospital where he was pronounced dead. I didn't think that they would ever tell me that my son is dead. We need to determine that it wasn't an accident, that it wasn't a suicide, that indeed it was a homicide. Listen to everybody, I don't care where you live in the city, don't want to walk out of our house and hear gunshots. It's just completely fucked up to me. Yeah, but what's crazier is that that feeling, it happens so often. People are influenced by things they see, things they hear, and people they hang around. For many of our community, our barbershops become our therapy centers. You know, our, you know, um, corner stores become our therapy centers. And although that's good, sometimes many of our men and boys need more than that. It can be really unsettling at times to know that young people, 14, 15, 16 year olds, have access to, to those types of weapons. One of two things is usually gonna happen. Let's keep it real. 
either we gonna get them or the streets gonna get them. Oh, I, I done lost a couple niggas that done die way too young. At the funeral shedding tears, we had to cry way too young. Straight bullets taking lives, it's hard to survive where I'm from. I seen kids leaving school and they die on their way home. And even make it to the crib, thought it was safe for where we live. But it ain't safe anywhere anymore. Niggas blocking bullets with babies, with my city going crazy Nowadays I just can't take it, I can't take it It's like all the pain I feel inside, I just wanna give away All the pain I've been trying to hide, they can see it in my face I done lost a couple homies, I know the streets ain't safe Knowing that we gotta 